competitions and, and how they work within a Cabanas program, why we have competitions, what are the good points, what are the bad points, etc. We'll start off though with a little story. So once upon a time, we had the chief of staff of the Army and a sergeant major of the Army in our gym. So imagine the entourage they had with them was probably like 50 people or something. And so we said to the group, who's the best runner in the group? And they all knew immediately, they were like, ah, oh, you know, Major Longlegs, you know, just won the Marine Corps Marathon. Like, cool, we value that. And so who's the best shot? And there were crickets, right? Nobody had any idea who the best shot was. So, okay, who's the best fighter? And nobody had any idea about that one either. I said, okay, so what you're telling me is that this organization values running over shooting and fighting, which is okay if we're gonna run from the enemy. But if we're gonna to run towards the enemy, the shooting and fighting are gonna get more important every step, right? So, so let's think about that for a second. Why do you suppose it is that they valued running over shooting and fighting? Right? And they can't argue that they didn't because everybody knew who the best runner was for a reason, right? They valued it. And everybody didn't know the other two because even though they thought they valued it, it wasn't really part of their values, okay? So why do you suppose they did? Well, the answer is that almost the whole army is going to fall out tomorrow morning. They're going to right face, forward march, and take off on a run, right? And what's going to happen about a mile into that run is the first person that's going to start to fall back. And what do we all think of that person? Like we all think the same thing, right? We didn't even have to say it out loud because we all think the same thing of that person falling out of the run. In fact, even that turd wishes that some other turd would fall out because they don't want to be that person, right? So the reason we value running is because there's the threat of public humiliation associated with being poor at it. And I'm going to tell you that, like, listen, note that that's real, right? You are not going to have a successful career as a soldier if you're an incompetent runner. If you're the one who falls out every time as the leader of your platoon, company, or whatnot, you're never going to get a company if this happens, but if you fall out every time and you're that one, well, you need to do some running between now and then because you're not going to have a successful career, right? We value that as an army. There's a threat of public humiliation associated with it, okay? So, well, that's half the battle, but the other half is we also have the threat of public accolades or the promise of public accolades, right? What happens about another mile in when the leader says, all right, release, everybody race back to the, the barracks or whatnot? What happens then? Well, all the rabbits take off, right? And everybody wishes they were one of those rabbits. Everybody. I mean, maybe not enough to go out and do the PT to be one of those rabbits, but you get the idea, right? So what this illustrates is an informal competition almost daily is the reason why we value running in the Army. It's not because anybody made some decision, like, let's have a committee together and let's figure out which one is more important, running or shooting. And so, oh, let's definitely, and running got more votes. Right? That's not how it happened, right? It happened because we value PT, it's easy to go for a run as part of PT, we don't even have to think about that one, and then we do it together all the time. And so people who are good at it, we know, people who suck at it, we know, okay? So that's an informal competition. That's an that's a, uh, important kind of concept to understand, that it's a tool to control the culture within our organization. So imagine, how would we accomplish that same task with shooting? So think about this, in your unit right now, who's the best shot? Okay, do you have any idea? So why not? Because mostly in the Army, when you go to the range, who knows how you did? It's typically you, maybe the person who helped you finger whip your score, and then the company clerk, right? And that's probably it, right? So what happens if we came back though and posted all those scores on the wall? What would happen then? Well, we all know what would happen. This is what the people would walk up to and they'd be like, Larson, you shot a 14, man. You suck at this, right? All right? Next time we go out, we're just going to give you a sharp stick because you can't shoot anyway, right? And, <laughs> and all that would happen, right? And then, next time we went to the range, everybody would try a little harder, wouldn't they? Because they'd be a little bit worried about getting humiliated. Okay? Or, if you gave accolades to the people at the top, maybe, you know, the winner gets a four day, pretty soon everybody would know who the best one was and the worst, and we'd value it more. And when we valued it more, people would be better at it, okay? And how would you do that with fighting? Imagine that for a second. Yeah, you gotta get people fighting, right? So I can tell you how we used to do it in the old days, you know, back in the D 
Neanderthal era when we first started this in the second Ranger Battalion. It used to go like this. We'd have a payday activities, which was once a month we got our checks, right? So we used to have, have a formation and it gives our checks. And then we'd go and pay our bills that day. That's how old I am. But with that being said, it used to be that the battalion sergeant major on those days would call people out at random. So it'd be, okay, give me the first squad leader, second platoon, Charlie Company, and the first squad leader, first platoon, Alpha Company. Those guys would fall out in front of the whole battalion, and they'd fight. Okay. <laughs> so, what do you suppose happens in that unit? So here's the dynamic, right? Over there at Alpha Company, there's that guy running his pie hole, right? The, the proverbial, I would just shoot you guy. There's a couple of things of note here. The first one is that we're making fun of the, I would just shoot you guy, right? So we all know who that guy is in our unit. Let's make fun of him, okay? So with that being said, what happens when he gets called out? He falls out in front of the whole battalion. He gets twisted up like, a, like, somebody's, like he's a piece of paper that somebody's finished with, right? And then what? And he's got to run back to his company and fall back in formation, having been publicly humiliated, right? Then publicly outed that this was just to cover up the fact that he's not that tough. Everybody get the idea, right? We used to sell t-shirts in the old days in the combatives program that said, we both know why you don't like combatives. That's a, and, and we do, right? We know why people don't like combatives. It's not like, I just don't think soldiers need to know how to fight, right? There's nobody making that argument, right? So with that being said, we know what's up, and we know what's up with that guy. And so now, what happens in that unit? Imagine the culture in that organization. What happens in that unit? First off, how many times does that have to happen? At yeah, once, right? Happens once. Because after that, everybody realizes to be socially acceptable in that unit, you must be a competent fighter. That's it. Right? Now, what's the standard, do you suppose? How good do you got to be? Competent and tenacious. That's the standard. Nobody cares if you go out there and lose. People go up, care if you go out there and you just get humiliated because you don't know what you're doing. Right? That guy who doesn't want to train. That guy. He gets humiliated. Right? So I'm going to come back on that point in a minute, but I want to emphasize that point about informal competitions. They're a tool. Competitions in general. They're a tool to control the culture within our unit. Okay? We get people to value things that we make them do. And the threat of public humiliation and the promise of public accolades are the way that actually works. Just exactly like we currently do with running. Probably nobody ever told you that's what's up with running as a unit, right? But that's actually what's up with running as a unit. The person who falls out is humiliated. The people who don't are not humiliated. Together we have a group of people who are competent and tough. Get the idea, right? So with all that being said, let's, let's talk about the Army's combatives program in general for a while. So the Army has had combatives doctrine for a long time. The first, the first Army combatives manual was actually a translation of a French bayonet fighting manual and it translated in 1852 by George McClellan when he was a captain. So that's a good thing to know, by the way. So with that being said, since 1852, we have had formal combatives doctrine. Okay. And interestingly enough, the bayonet fencing that was, was in that manual, that was the combatives program of every European style army from the 1830s all the way up until World War I. So when World War I happened, there were a couple of things that changed that made that go away. Okay. One of them was that it didn't meet the needs of the battlefield. So imagine bayonet fencing, for example. So the bayonet fencing was not just the hand-to-hand -hand combat system. It was um, a formal kind of competition. It was in the Olympics until the 1936 Olympics. Okay? The four styles of fencing were uh, foil, FE, saber, and bayonet in the Olympics, right? So why did it die out? Well, the first reason is it didn't meet the needs of the battlefield. So imagine the bayonet fencing strip. What would be an advantage on that? Okay, so long weapons for one. So if you look at the rifles at that time, like the most of the game, some of those are really long. We even had a two and a half foot long sword bayonet in our arsenal for a while, right? So if you're on the bayonet strip, that seems like a pretty good idea to have a longer weapon. Now jump into a trench and you've got what essentially is a long single shot pipe, right? It's not like you're going to come around the corner of the trench with your bolt action rifle, shoot it and then like cycle the bolt, shoot it again, right? So it's mostly just one shot and now a long pipe, right? 
So the soldiers in that era figured out that it was better to just bring a bag full of frags and a shovel or an axe or something like that, if, as far as it goes. So frag the next section of the trench, come around with a hatchet. That's a way better idea, right? So that's what they did. They wouldn't even bring their rifles. Okay. So that was one reason why it didn't survive the war. But the other reason is more important, so an important thing for us all to understand, and that is it was a mass army. So think about this. If you go back and look at the armies that we had at various times in our history, right? So imagine, for example, when the United States invaded Mexico. If you look at the battles that were involved and the total number of troops involved in those battles, it's like five, 6,000 people for the big ones, okay? So compare that to the number of soldiers involved in the battles of our Civil War. Now compare that to the number of people involved in the battles of World War I and World War II. So what, for example, is the difference between the siege warfare around Petersburg during the, the, our Civil War and the Western Front in World War I? The main difference wasn't machine guns. The main difference was millions and millions of people. We had enough people in the armies of both sides to have an unending chain of people all the way from the ocean to Switzerland. Huge armies, right? Okay, so how many soldiers do you think we had in our army in 1913, 1914, as compared to 1918? So I'll give you some numbers that I know, right? So in 1939, we had 125,000 people in our army. Okay, 125,000. Half of those were in the coastal defense artillery. That means our maneuver army was only like 60,000 people total for our entire global footprint. Okay? So how many people did we have in our army in 1945? Yeah, that number is like 12 million or something like that, right? A crazy big number. You know, enough to fight World War II. Okay? So how much training time do you think <coughs> soldiers got in that gin up from the 1914 or 15 army to the 1918 army, or the 1939 army to the 1945 army. Not much. In World War I, it was down to four weeks of formal training. So you would get somebody in off the street, a conscript coming in from the hills of Kentucky or someplace, four weeks of marching, right? Maybe shooting the rifle, dig a couple of trenches, off to war. That was it. So what that means is there was not time for any sort of skill-based system. And fencing is a skill, right? So what did they do instead of a skill-based system? Well, they came up with an unskill-based system, which is the bayonet soft cores, pugil sticks, all those sort of things. And those were our hand-to-hand -hand combat program, essentially, all the way until 2002, until the modern system came into being, okay? So that's an important thing to note. Because how long did our mass conscript army era last? Until Vietnam. Until the 70s, right? Until after Vietnam, right? Because the Vietnam, the, our Vietnam era army, that was a mass conscript army. Most of the soldiers ran for two years. And that includes their training and their combat deployment, and then out, right? That was the majority of the army. So imagine for a second the challenge of being a platoon leader in that era. You know what it took to be a squad leader in that army? Yeah, they used to send them to a four-week course after basic training. So here's basic training, four more weeks, you're a staff sergeant. They used to call them shake and bake sergeants, right? So that was your job, was to be in charge of squads led by those guys at war, okay? So our army's drastically different than that, <clears throat> you know? They didn't even really have like a professional NCO corps at those lower levels in that army. But now we do because we don't have a conscript army anymore, right? We have a professional army. And since we have a professional army, we can start to be able to do things like they did in the last time we had a professional army a hundred and something years ago. Get the idea, right? So now we can start to have skill-based systems, okay? So that's an important note. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about how the combatives program got to be because it's sort of illustrative of what, of the lessons I'm teaching here. Right? So <clears throat> when we came back from the, the invasion of Panama, I was in the uh, first range lieutenant in those days, and we learned that we didn't know much about close quarters battle, about fighting in built up areas. Because to think about that, when was the last time before the invasion of Panama that U.S. forces were involved in large amounts of urban combat? You know, in Vietnam era, it was mostly in the, out in the open terrain, and the, uh, you know, maybe the Battle of Way, a couple of them like that, but not very much, right? Most of the fight was just out in the forest and whatnot. 
So we really didn't know that much about it. So we came back, we fought, we knew all about fire maneuver and that kind of stuff. But we came back, we learned, we need, we knew we needed to learn a lot about close quarters battle. So we sent people around a whole bunch of places and to learn that. And I was fortunate enough to go to train with one of these units that was already that was already tuned up on it. And I brought back from that modern shooting. Okay, so how many of you guys have been on a stress shoot? Done that since you've been here. Okay, so so modern marksmanship, the way it's taught, battlefield marksmanship or close quarters marksmanship, the way it's taught in the army, is actually a derivative of a civilian form of competition called action shooting. There used, there's an organization, there used to be the only organization called the IPSC, which is the International Practical Shooting Confederation. So their competitions go like this, they're, they're mock gunfights. So for example, it's a scenario, it might be I'm a clerk at a 7-Eleven and my pistol is in the top drawer, right? And there'd be a display of targets in front of me and there's somebody over my shoulder with a timer that has an audible beep to start and then can hear my shots. So the way it would happen is as a competitor, you may be like, at the surrender position or something. When you hear that beep, employ your weapon, shoot all the targets, and whenever it's done, the timer knows how long it took you. So you add up the scores from each of the targets. Let's just say there were six, and you had five points per shot, two shots per 30 points. Divide that by the time it took you. So you end up with a score that is a ratio for how many points you were scoring per second of shooting. You get the idea. So essentially, your accuracy and your speed count equally the way they do in battle, right? You can't miss fast enough, for example, right? You get the idea. So I brought that concept back, the first range battalion. We started a club, it was called the Sunday Night Slaughter. Every Sunday after church, we'd all get together and have a shooting competition and um, yeah, practice killing people. And then, and this went on for a couple of years and we got pretty good at it, right? Now, everybody in our club was a combat veteran or was at least a ranger, so we knew we were going to combat in the future. So for us, this was a training thing, right? We were prepping to get better for war. That's what we were about. But as we got better, we started going out to shoot in competitions out around the civilian world. And as soon as we got out there, we realized that they were quite different to us. What do you suppose was different? Well, they were some, in large part better than us. They've been doing it longer. But more importantly, they were focused on the competition. Right, so think about that for a second. What do competitors in any organization try to do? Try to win, right? Okay, so that's not the same thing as training for war, is it? Okay, so I'll give you a great example of how this plays out in other combat sports. Because shooting is just an example. But it plays out in, all, in every combat sport. What's the defense to the double leg takedown in boxing? And there isn't one, right? And why is it there a defense to the double leg takedown in boxing? Because, no takedown. because boxers are not training to win fights. They're training to win boxing matches. Not the same thing, right? What's the defense to the jab in wrestling? There isn't one because wrestlers are training to win wrestling matches, not fights. It's not the same thing. So that is an inevitable thing when you put rules on something and you start competing, humans will want to compete and therefore they'll want to win. They'll train to work within the rules and win, okay? So that's something for us to understand because we have to control that. So back to the Ranger experience shooting, right? Our guys, the difference between us and the, and the civilians was for them, they were training for the competitions, right? And for us, the competitions were training. See the difference, right? We were using the competitions as a way to push our skill level higher so we would be more effective at war, not as, as an end of themselves. You get the idea? Okay, so for example, around here, we're gonna have competitions here. Notice our midterms and our finals are competitions, aren't they? Okay, but what's the point? The point isn't to ensure that you're better fighters. That's actually not it at all, right? It's the point, or it's not about who wins to us. We actually do not <coughs> care who the toughest person in any given class is, right? It doesn't make any difference at all as far as the Army's concerned. So what then is the point? Because you guys all come up to it and you say, ah, you know, your focus is on how do I score grades, blah, 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 which we're gonna talk to you more about later, but understand that those are all off the point, right? The point is that you're gonna fight hard, okay? So, what is the advantage that competitions give us then? 
What do they do for us? Okay? Let's just imagine this, right? Anybody here fighting in the brigade boxing open this time? Anybody? No? Okay, so what do we get as a core from having brigade boxing championships? Here's what we really get. Some people get spurred on to excellence, okay? Some people will push themselves farther and harder to learn more because they're gonna compete, okay? That's the same way with all our competitions, right? Imagine, we, this, this institution, we have lots and lots of formal competition. Have you ever seen the times that like the cross country team pulls in on their runs or, you know, you, you pick it, right? Like, we have a thousand different kinds of competitions and people drive themselves to a crazy level, try to compete, be the best in all the schools, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, so that's an important thing, right? There's a reason why, for example, the shooting I was just talking about, even though the civilians are not focused on the battlefield, the best units in the world hire the best competitive shooters to come help them become better shooters, okay? They hire them because those guys have driven their skill level to a crazy high level. There's the only way you can get that high level is through competitions. When you add competitions to stuff, everybody will push themselves even higher. You're gonna, there's a million examples. Have you ever seen like, like what they're doing at the CrossFit Games and whatnot? Like, like you pick it, right? All the different things we got going on here. Man, the levels can get really high, right? Okay, so with that being said, that's an important thing. It spurs on excellence, competitions, okay? But what did you get out of the boxing smokers last time? Did you become a better boxer because of that? Did you become a better football player because we have a good football team? <laughs> Maybe a bad example. How about you? Better football player because, yeah. How about you? Are you a faster runner because we have a, a Division I track cross country team here? You see the point, right? Which is we want to be able to give those people reason to excel. That's an important thing. Those are formal competitions like that. But how do we get everybody to be better? Imagine if we said four times a year, every one of you is going to be involved in a boxing match while you're here, right? What would go on? Everybody would be trained in boxing, right? It would be that simple. And the boxing level of the general cadet would go way up. Get the idea, right? So informal competitions give us that, okay? They give us the fact that all ships are gonna rise with informal competitions. Back to our just shoot you guy. How can that guy survive in a place where we're having informal competitions for fighting? He can't. He goes away, right? Like not that he personally goes away, but that personality trait goes away because even he must become competent. And that's exactly what happens too. Imagine this, you're that guy. You just came out, you were running your mouth, you probably shouldn't have, you got out there, you got twisted up by everybody. You run back into your formation. What do you do? Start training, right? Because the next time you come out and whip somebody, that is gone. Everybody knows you're tough. It's like what happens when you fall out of a rut? Go get in better shape. Don't fall out of any more ruts. As soon as you bear fast on the next one, your reputation comes right back, right? It's elastic. That's how it works, okay? So that being said, um, imagine this. What do your soldiers expect of you? As far as being a, sh a runner, a fighter, a shooter, what do they expect of you? Do they expect you to be the best runner in the platoon? It's nice if you're the best runner in the platoon, but they don't expect that, right? Can you survive if you're not the best runner in your platoon? Yeah, for sure. Okay, what about fighting? Do you have to be the best fighter in your platoon? Yeah, so in the early days of this program, the company commander was in charge of this guy named Castles. And he was small, he weighed like 135 pounds, right? And he was the commander, so he's always busy. But every time we were scrapping, he would get out there and scrap with everybody. And he would lose a lot because he's small and didn't get trained that much because he was busy, right? So what do you think everybody thought of him? Everybody thought he was a stud because what did they expect? Nobody expected the 135-pound guy who's busy all the time to come out and win all his fights. They expected him to be tough and competent, right? Now, I've only been teaching here a year and a half but I can tell you that's like 1,800 students that we've seen come through and fight here. You know how many people I've seen step out onto this mat, scrapping, and embarrass themselves? No one. Not a single one. Because what's the standard that we demand of you? Tough.
conf and confident, exactly like your students are going or your soldiers are going to demand from you, right? We demand the same thing, and you demand it from each other. You're going to watch in those fights, and you're going to see everybody, everybody puts it out there, and they all have a level of confidence. And it's kind of like the old joke about like uh, you know being chased by a bear, right? Do I got to be faster than the bear? No, I just need to be faster than that guy, right? It's the same thing, right? Who do we need to be a better fighter than? Yeah, the person we end up fighting, right? We're going to war, who's that gonna be? Random person. How many people in the world, how many people in the world understand the rear mount and the rear naked choke? Such a small percentage that if you go to the rear mount and choke them out and you find somebody who didn't, that doesn't work on, let me know. It'll be like an anomaly, right? That never, that never happens, everybody, gets choked out whenever you try that, because people out there don't know. You already know more than all this, right? I missed something on my list. That's pretty much it. Okay, I'll tell you a couple more things. How much time we got? 30, <coughs> 30 minutes. Okay, cool, I'm going fast. Okay, so I'll tell you a couple more things about combative competitions as we, uh, or about competitions in general before we go out. One of them is, remember I told you about how the rules will Will change. That's the same for every combative sport. So we talked about boxing and wrestling, but it's the same for Muay Thai, you know, karate, you name it, right? So I'll give you a great example. Is the UFC a real fight? It's not a real fight, right? So why isn't it a real fight? Yeah, it's the exact same thing we were just talking about. The rules are just a little more open, right? So for example, we went out there. Perfect example. Lay on your, sit down on your butt like Okay, anybody remember there used to be this uh, fighting organization called Pride, it was in Japan, a couple of you guys remember that? Okay, in Pride, the rule was you could kick the guy in the head when he was down, right? Pretty cool rules. So you used to see guard passing techniques like this, right? Boom, right? Like, <laughs> kick the guy right in the grave. So, so, nobody in the UFC does that, right? Why not? Against the rules, right? It's not because it's not a great technique. It's a great technique, right? <laughs> but nobody does it because it's not within their rules, right? So they're fighting in a tactical vacuum. This is an important thing to note, right? When two people come out with sort of a gentleman's agreement not to fight each other's nose off, gouge each other's eyes, nobody's got a gun on their belt, nobody's carrying a knife, and nobody's buddies are going to jump in, it's not a real fight, okay? And if we put more restrictive rules than that on it, all of a sudden, we've got people training to do things that are not necessarily the best thing to do. So I'll give you another good example, right? Even in Pride, you never saw anybody using this guard pass technique, right? But it's a pretty effective technique, right? <laughs> Fairly easy to master as well, right? <laughs> but they're fighting within their rule set, okay? And I'm not, as I said, I'm not down on the rule set, right? We try to. But, but think about it, when we change the rules in all sports, why do we change them? Doesn't matter if it's the UFC or NASCAR or the NBA, why do they change the rules? Right, there's two reasons really. The first one is safety, right? Change the rules because they think it's safe. Like for example, the Russians thought in their hand-to-hand -hand system, Sambo, that it was too dangerous to have chokes, so they didn't have any chokes in their competitions, okay? So that's a good example, safety, okay? What's the other reason they changed the rules? To make it more exciting, right? When they change the rules of NASCAR or the NBA or the UFC, those are the reasons, right? Why do you think they wear four ounce gloves in the UFC? In the first UFC, there were four semifinalists naturally. Three of them had broken hands, right? The fourth was Hoist Gracie who didn't throw any punches. Because when you hit people with your fist in the skull, everybody look at that, what's your hand designed for? Grasping stuff, right? We use the spindly little bones of this grasping implement as a bludgeon against somebody's bone helmet. <laughs> Often the spindly little bones lose, right? So they put the four ounce gloves on to keep them from breaking their hands when they hit each other. So they hit each other more, so it'll be more exciting, right? It's not because it's the best way to fight, it's because it's more exciting. Simple as that, okay? So that's an important thing to understand about the rule sets, how they work. So, so just to kind of recap, what do we get out of having competitions? What's the, what's the best thing about them? Best thing about them? First, first excellence, right? We get the fact that we push people towards excellence out of competitions, right? 
What's the, what is the biggest drawback of having competition? Right, it takes us off our focus on combat, right? So best way to imagine that is it's taking us off asthma. What happens when you're five degrees off asthma at 1,000 at meters? And what about at 2,000? What about at 10,000, right? So this is the way these combat sports happen. They all start out as ways to win fights, every one of them, right? Wrestling, boxing, Muay Thai, fencing, you name it. They all start out as a way to win fights. But then as they grow, they get farther and farther away from that. You know, for example, up until the 36 Olympics in freestyle wrestling, you could win by submission. So the next Olympic after that was then not until 1948, and they took the submissions out. So what do you think the entire wrestling world stopped training on? That's right. So it doesn't exist in wrestling anymore because of that rule change. Because what are wrestlers training for? Competition. Winning competitions, right? Not winning fights. Different thing, right? Okay. So I would tell you, uh, just as another example, this, the most valuable thing about combatives is that it's a tool that we can use to teach people to have a warrior ethos within our organization, right? I mean, imagine this. What part of the Army is not going to be fighting? So let's say AG, right? Let's even go better. How about the Space Command? Yeah. How about Space Command, right? How about Chaplain's Assistance, right? Oh, what do all those people have in common with everybody else in the Army? Uh, they move around the battlefield, right? There are no people walking around in this uniform that don't move around the battlefield. What happens when you're moving around the battlefield and the lead vehicle in your convoy gets blown off the face of the earth and somebody blocks in the last one and you're canalized by having buildings on both sides? What happens to all the space commandos and the AG Corps? Yeah, the provisional infantrymen. It's exactly what happens, right? They unass the vehicles and they start clearing rooms and shooting people, hopefully. Okay? There's nobody in the Army who's not in that job. Not a single one. There's a reason why we all wear this green suit, right? What do you suppose that reason is? Like if, look, safety was actually first, what color would we wear? Orange, right? It would be way safer. Nobody ever get run over by cars because we'd all have orange. We'd see everybody, right? But safety isn't first. What's first? We all wear this outfit because this is our sneak up on people and kill them outfit, right? Or they're trying to sneak out us and kill us. One of those two, right? Every single one of us. So how do we make sure we remind everybody that there are those people? Well, if you're in a unit that's fighting all the time, it's pretty hard to forget that you're the ones who might have to do the fighting, right? Everybody get the idea? You ever heard of the 507th Maintenance Unit? Yeah, right. So one of the interesting things about that, and that's Jessica Lynch's unit if you haven't heard of them. One of the interesting things about the AAR on that was that every single weapon malfunctioned. Every single one. Every rifle, pistol, etc., machine gun, all malfunctioned in their fight. Why do you suppose that was? They didn't do weapons maintenance, right? Why didn't they do weapons maintenance? They didn't, need it. they didn't think they'd have to fight. Yeah, they were a maintenance unit. That's not the ones who do the fighting, right? AG Corps doesn't do the fighting, do they? No, we all do the fighting. And if you are in a unit that's fighting all the time, fighting each other all the time, training to fight all the time, then you know you have to do weapons maintenance. And you know that you are going to have to do first aid. And you know that you're going to have to do land that. Because what happens if you're that maintenance unit commander and you don't know how to land that? What happened to them? You get lost, you get ambushed, none of your soldiers know how to fight, and your whole unit gets wiped out. Right? And it'll be because you thought, oh, I wasn't the one that had to do the fighting. Everybody get the idea? Okay, so I will just leave you with the last thing. We can control the culture of our organization. These are the levers we have. Okay? And that's our job. What does leadership mean? Right? What is leadership? It's providing purpose, direction, and motivation, right? What that means is we provide the motivation. That's our job. I have a really unmotivated unit. Your fault. Right? Boy, my unit seems to have no purpose. Your fault. Okay? We provide purpose, direction, and motivation. Combatives is maybe the best tool we have to making sure everybody knows that they're in the part of the army that's going to do the fighting. But it's also just an example of how you can control the culture within your unit by understanding the positions you put them in and the tasks you make them do. Any questions on any of this stuff I've covered? Okay, so 